Welcome to the Museum of Sonoma County. I'm Jeff Nathanson, Executive Director and Art Curator, and I'm so pleased you're all here to join us for this Black History Month program today. So happy Black History Month, happy Lunar New Year. Uh, it's just great to be together. So many people here for this program that we have going on. Before we get going with the program, uh, I would just want to do a few acknowledgements. First of all, thank you to our staff and our volunteer crew who are working today. We couldn't put these programs on without your hard work and dedication. Let's hear it for our staff and volunteers. Thank you so much. How many people are members of the museum? Fantastic, thank you so much for your support. If you're not a member of the Museum of Sonoma County, we invite you to consider joining. It's only with your support that we can do programs like we are presenting today and the exhibitions and other programs that we have going on every month and throughout the year. Before we get going with today's program, I just want to say a couple of things about other exhibitions that are on view right now. In this gallery, just on the other side of this wall, a question of balance. There are selections from Pacific Rim Sculptors, a sculptors group that we have collaborated with in order to bring you this amazing exhibition. And in our other building, the historic old post office, which dates back to 1910, by the way. It really is an amazing building. We have an exhibition on view by the painter Tilden Dakin, who was a contemporary of Jack London's. Beautiful exhibition, I hope you'll see it. I also want to now acknowledge our board of directors. We have a few members of the board here. Uh, we could not do this work without your incredible hard work and support. Thank you. And now, without further ado, our program for today. For Black History Month, today we are presenting the artist Rose Hill. You can see her work on the back wall. And she's in conversation with Denise Ward. And we're so pleased to have both Rose and Denise here to present to you today. I'm so looking forward to this conversation. Denise? <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I want to first uh, thank our indigenous partners of Sonoma County. Uh, the County of Sonoma recognizes that we're on ancestral lands of the Coast Miwok, Pomo, and Wapu na Native peoples who are the original caretakers of this land. We respectfully acknowledge the indigenous people who have been stewarding and maintaining relationships on this land as knowledge keepers for a millennia. We acknowledge indigenous peoples as their traditional stewards of the land. This land acknowledgement calls us to commit to continuing to learn how to be better stewards of the land we inhabit. We recognize that every resident of Sonoma County has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land. I also want to thank a few people before I really get started here today, so I have to write down words, okay? I want to thank... Um, um, Jeff and the museum for having us back. And I also want to acknowledge a couple of people who really made this possible. Um, I want to acknowledge Faith Ross. She's the president of Petaluma Blacks Community Development. She indulges me in all kinds of crazy ideas I come up with. And um, Faith, can you stand please? I also want to acknowledge uh, Lisa Demetrius. Can you stand, please? <laughs> she is the director of Petaluma Arts Center, and she has also been gracious to, to um, have our next weekend's talk with my friend, come around here, Orrin Carpenter. He and I will have a conversation next Sunday afternoon. No, at Petaluma Arts Center in, in Petaluma. 
And I also want to acknowledge Ms. Gloria Robinson, who's not here today. She's the founder of Petaluma Blacks for Community Development. That organization's 46 years old now. We uh, celebrate every year with um, all kinds of uh, beautiful uh, uh, artwork right now at the Petaluma Historical Museum downtown Petaluma, and also um, a number of events that are going on uh, for this year's celebration. We're celebrating the Year of the Arts, uh, African Americans and the Arts. And so today, I have the pleasure of speaking with a new old friend. I would say new, but really old friend, Rose Hill, talking about her beautiful artwork and her journey as an artist. Um, so today, we're gonna get started, and I wanna introduce my friend, Rose Hill. So, Rose, your work is everywhere. It's collected worldwide. Um, your work has been um, shown in lots of different places in museums and galleries all over the country. Is that correct? <laughs> now, but specifically, that um, Rose has a, a, an avenue that she's taken. It's called Black Americana Art. And if you look at behind you in the beautiful artwork behind you on the, on the walls there. These are um, a series of mirrors that Rose has committed to uh, this gallery for um, this month. Uh, Rose, I love what you represent in your artwork. You address a beautiful period and a dark period in the artwork that we, as Americans, haven't been able to get comfortable with and that we're perfectly comfortable with every single day. Um, when I first saw Rose's art, I realized it was part of my childhood, part of my life, um, memories, um, pieces of art that I have in my home, my childhood, my parents' childhood, my grandmother's house. So I felt immediately at home with your artwork. It, it honored things that I love and it also addressed things that we here in America are still trying to address every day. I want to ask you um, specifically about how you began doing this art. Well, it started, oh, sorry you guys. It started with collecting, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I started collecting at the suggestion of my older sister just for interior design dolls in my apartment at the time. And that led to collecting black memorabilia. And over the years, I've, I have quite a few pieces in my collection. But I think my art was born from that collection. Well, I, what I liked about visiting your studio specifically was that it is a story that's just woven through the walls. It's incredible in that it tells this really rich story of an amazing imagination, and it, ref it always refers to stories that have been owned by other people but came from a base that might have been deeply from uh, fables or stories that were told to people that were... Um, on plantations, uh, living in foreign countries, uh, appropriating interesting stories, and then making them popular in this country. You know, I think these stories have been around for a really, really long time. Right. And I think the way they became popular in America is another thing entirely. That's why when this whole political correctness uh, with these stories happen, to me it seemed like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Because it's one thing what, what happened here in America, but a lot of these stories are, are from Africa right. and, and far back. How do you throw away something like that that's part of our history? Well, I just always think about, specifically, because I got a lot of questions from my kid about 
um, the Br'er Rabbit story. We got the, the, the story from the Pink Pinkney drawings, and then they were later made by an African-American artist, uh, the book was. And the rabbits, the story's completely different. It's, it's a whole different story than, well, than the original story that I read when I was a kid. Well, the, I'm, I'm going to ask you, uh -huh. was it Joel Chandler Harris's yes. story yes. that you read? Yes. That's the only one I know. Well, that one from childhood, yes. Yes, that that's was a, the one I'm attached to. Okay. Um, why, why I became attached to it was because of the dialect. It's right. written the way slaves spoke back in the day. Right. And they, couldn't, they weren't allowed to be educated, so they butchered the language. All of that is fine with me. Right. I don't have any negative feeling toward the way they spoke. That was what was going on then. They had no other choice. They had no education. So they, again, they butchered the language. So because that speaking was humorous, I suppose, to a, a large portion of America, it became popular because of the dialect. Right. I find the dialect, um, my parents spoke similar to that. Right. So I'm attracted to it for a different reason. Right. I, I, it feels like I'm embracing my culture and my family when I hear that, you know. I don't speak that way, but I love the sound of it. Right. Because my parents spoke that way. So my, my view on it was when I read it as a child, I'd been reading for, I don't know, two or three years, and I asked my mother, why is it written like this? How come these people are talking like this? And her answer was, because that's how people spoke. That's, that was her answer. And I never thought about it again. I read the, child, the book when I was maybe eight years old. Later, the, the new version of this book comes out, and it's not written the same. Uh. It's not written the same at all. Written by a black man, but it's not written the same. And I had, a, I don't know, 20 questions from my kid about, well, why would the rabbit do this? And so we got, we got so tied up with the story. So what, it, what I'm trying to get underneath here is that stories uh, in this culture are always change. Where somebody is always appropriating a different kind of view on a story and making it um, the newer version. Or more, more politically palatable. correct. Cor more politically correct. But you know, the interesting did. thing to me is children do not approach these stories at all with baggage. Ever. So they're, they're approaching it innocently. They fall in love for dif different reasons because they don't have the baggage and these associated with, with it. With the story at all. I didn't when I was a kid. I just asked why they wrote the story this way. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about today was really about your art as a, as a ceramicist, your artwork, how you decide that it is going to be a motif of mosaic as opposed to somebody else would maybe make your artwork, where it's so very, very formal, where all of the images are the same, where your images are beautiful, they're fragmented, they're whole, they're fragmented. That was the thing I was drawn to your work from, in that you'll have part of a tiger tail, and then you'll have his face, and then you'll have a boy's face, then you'll have a whole body. How did you decide that creating that sort of atmosphere on your, on your mirrors and in some of the other pieces that you make. How did you get to that? I didn't decide that. That just happened. You know, I, I am a, a self-taught artist, so I, I'm not a ceramicist at all. When I learned to paint, when I realized I could paint or had this in me, I just went out and bought all the equipment and acted like I was a ceramic person, but I wasn't. I didn't even love it. I, I liked the idea of painting on ceramics. I liked that it was functional. I liked that it belonged in the kitchen. All of those things felt good to me. Um, but I really didn't have the expertise or know-how 
with ceramics. So I made sure cuts. Uh, you know, I painted on things that were molded already. Right. Uh, they were ceramic. All I had to do was glaze and fire them after I painted, which made it easy for me. Uh, how I got to mosaics was breaking. You know, I was doing a show and I had a, a very inexpensive cart and all of my things fell over and broke. So I, it was like, I, wh I, what am I going to do? I, I had to do something with it. So I made mosaics and, and I liked the chaos of the mosaic. I liked that things were juxtaposed and they weren't where they were supposed to be. I like that look better. I like chaos more than order. Well, that, that's what I, I love about the pieces. That's what I love about it. Because I like you have, you have an entire person and then you have a hand yeah, or a face. Yeah, I like all of that crazy. Yeah, well, that's what I love about it. And I, I beg to differ with you about this ceramics business because um, even though you paint on ceramics, I, I mean, I watched the pottery throw down. You're a ceramic artist, okay? Yeah, I don't know. Well, you know, I'm doing it all over again. I decided that I, uh, I don't like painting on molded tiles and things anymore. So I just bought myself a slab roller. I'm going to try and do clay again and see if I can start laying, uh, rolling my own slabs and, and doing my own tile. Because it's, well, then you have more control. Well, I like the outcome more. I don't know if I can control. We'll see how it turns out. <laughs> but I, I like the idea of not having preformed shapes and molds. Well, yeah, I, I get that from, from the, the pieces that you have back here. But I also love some of the molded forms that you did, too. Uh, you have a whole new series of the, the little girls that um, you did a series on plates, but you're also doing them on... Um, on canvas now as well and yeah I've been doing that for a little while the canvas it's just because it was easier to carry that's all <laughs> it was easier to carry and tote around and you, know? you mean in the, instead of yeah. 40 pounds you're carrying yeah. about hey the starving five. artist has to learn how exactly. to make how to make adjustments it was just to be able to schlep it around easier well um, that series, we should talk a little bit about that series, the, the Little Girl series, because mm -hmm. it's a series of beautiful little girls, and it's the backs of their heads. Well, that's the back of my head, okay? That was my head first through about fifth grade, and then I just had to wear a ponytail. I was, I was over braids at that point. But that, that represents my childhood, um, and having to be really dressed perfectly nice to go to church every Sunday. And you know you had your good, your good white socks on, your black patent leather shoes to go to church on Sunday, and this series really uh, hollers all the way down into my childhood. So it's a it's a love fest for me to be able to see these this, these images, and um, there's images here that are boys and girls, and you're working on that with your daughter Tish. My daughter Tish does boys. I don't do boys. I do girls, so Tish does the boys. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really, I really love this series. Now, and these are on canvas. These are not on ceramic. But I do them. I do them on ceramics as well. I started doing the girls from behind. Can you guys hear me? Okay, I started doing the girls from behind because I was commissioned to do a dinner service for twelve. And to not make it boring, I started flipping them around and painting them from behind as well. Uh -huh. But the girls from behind just took off. Everybody fell in love with the hairstyles. Yeah. And that's, then I got locked into it. I, you know, I had to do those hairstyles over and over. But um, they are the most popular. They are. And I do them on ceramics, canvas as well. Right. Yeah. And this, this series here with your, with your daughter, Tish, you, have you guys been doing this for a while? or for, Is well, this a new even, series? We don't even call it a series. Okay. We just did it. It, it was like uh, I had girls on canvas again because I was trying to make my life easier by having a lighter thing to schlep around and do pop-ups. And then they started asking for boys. 
And I called my daughter, I'm like, hey, you gotta deal with this, they're asking for boys. <laughs> so she started painting the boys to, you know, because people wanted that. And right. that's how the boys, now they're in demand, her boys. Her boys, yeah. So. And we can see more of your work here on the shelves in, in a number of different kinds of art pieces here. You've got them yeah. in, in cups I mean, and I, I ceramics. I was doing it all. I was doing functional ceramics for a long time. And I'm, I kind of got tired of functional ceramics. And I'm really into the mosaics now. Yeah. I like painting things and breaking them. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Well, it's, for me, it's um, uh, a beautiful form to tell a story in, in that normally if you find a piece of ceramic art, it is, well, it's everything. I mean, it's African, and it's, it's all kinds of ornate different things. But for me, it is the, the way you can look at these pieces and create your own story out of them just by wandering through one piece and just trying, trying to figure out what it was that it started out as, but then you start playing with the story yourself and creating your own idea of what you might have been thinking of when you made it. <laughs> Girl, when I'm painting these tiles, there's so many hairstyles in my head. They just flow out, they just pour out of me. <laughs> here, in this group of pictures here in your studio, we're looking at a whole new series of the, um, the queens, queens with the pearls. pearls. Yeah. Queens and pearls, I call them. And I created these guys because I took a trip to Germany. And I was there and the women were saying, pearls attract money. So I'm like, what? Pearls attract money? And they're like, yeah, pearls attract money. <laughs> So I started making the queens and pearls to remind women to wear their pearls. Because wow. pearls attract money. <laughs> well, this yeah. is, and are these, are these relatively new in your work? Because I... Say in the last couple years, yeah. the, the queens and pearls, maybe right. last three years or so. So mm -hmm. this is a question I never ask you at your studio, but I, I just always wondered, what, what pulled you into this? What, what pulled you into being an artist? How did this happen? Whew. Well, that's a, that's a funny story. My, my sister, my younger sister and I were trying to come up with an ethnic hair care line. And my sister said to me, she says, Rosie, I want the label to look like some of the stuff you collect. And we were living in Marin County, which is predominantly white. And I'm like, how are we going to go find a graphic artist over here to, to come up with a label? And I started playing with it, just, just playing with it. And my older sister said, hey, you're pretty good at this. Now, my older sister, Patricia, never gave compliments to me. She never. If ever I was drawing something, she like dismissed it like, you're not an artist. And this time she said, you're good at this. And I thought, whoa, if Patricia says I'm good at this, I'm going to do this. I quit my job and started doing it. <laughs> and I've never looked back. That's, I quit my job, and that's what I've been doing ever since. <laughs> that's, how. That, that's how you got in. <laughs> that's how it happened. <laughs> and, yeah, and so this has been this journey. How long has this journey been going? Because you know, I, I didn't I ask you questions. I started in 1996. 96. I think I was mid 40s. Mm -hmm. So our careers started about the same time. I walked away from TV about 1989. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just you have to walk away sometimes, right? Well, you know, I never had the experience of having something in me. I always had to train to learn how to do something. But to naturally be able to have something, gosh, when I saw that, I was, hey, I got it. This is what, <laughs> this is what I was given. I have to be true to it. So I, I pretty much did art. I got, you know, I was punished as a first grader for not putting things away uh, as a first grader. I had to sit in the hall a lot and the things I wasn't putting away was artwork. So really? I always did art. I mean, I my whole did. life. I, I never stopped. And when I wanted to walk away from all of that, I only wanted to do art. 
I didn't want to do anything else. I couldn't have imagined doing anything else. Wow. I've done a lot of other stuff, but you know, um, but that's how I got where I am today, just because I needed to. It's it's kind of a a sickness, a, uh, a possession, um, a uh, you you're you're trapped in your own creativity. I, I agree. You're trapped in your own creativity because in this life. You can do a lot of great things. People do all, every day, everywhere, all over the country, doing all kinds of great stuff every day. Doctors, uh, writers, uh, teachers, greatest people in the world, right? So I think artists are stuck in a world where order and re you know, regimented things exist, but the artist has to tell a story that is necessary to leave behind for others to remember we were here at all. Yeah. Because nothing yeah. else remains. Um, no, yeah. nothing else remains on the earth. We're still looking at Queen Puhabi's headdress from Babylon, okay? And we're still looking at pyramids in Mexico, and we're still looking at, they got ballerinas. So we're looking at art as the tool to remind us that we are humans on this planet. And the stories that your art tells is a reminder of a past that wants to be eradicated all the time. Um, in this country, we're still trying to make a voice loud enough that makes sense to be undisturbed and to be celebrated every day. That's what I find um, interesting. And today there's more artists than ever, okay? In America alone, there's probably, I would say, if we were gonna count in the tens or twenties of people, out of every 20 people, three of them are artists, okay? Whether they're producing and their art's known or people are looking at it, art's on fire right now. And it's because when you live in really crazy times, the artist wants to pronounce humanity, uh, love, uh, chaos, um, discourse, anger, beauty, all of it, to, to wake up humanity in a way that we become better, kinder, bigger, more beautiful, more loving, more wonderful. That's what art does, okay? And when you're telling your story, whether it is a reminder of the past, or the present, or an idea, or um, a combination of everything, of your imagination. I love your imagination. Well, it's based on reality. We wore all those hairstyles. The hairstyles were there. You know, I would love years in the future when I'm already off of this planet for somebody to dig up one of my pieces of ceramics and see these little girls. Girl, I would love that. I would love that. So. And have a girl say, well, how come we don't wear our hair like that anymore? Well, just to know we, we you know, yeah, yeah. There. This is us. This, this is, is yeah. who we were. Yeah. Um, new art. I want to ask you about new art. What's going to be? What's going to be? What's the leaning? What's the play? What's the, the plan for me in the near future? Is art, I'm focusing on mosaics. I just have all these things in my head that I have to see realized. So, so you're that's sticking what with I'm your. I'm going to do in the near future. I'm going to be working focus on your on your mosaics. mosaics. Yeah, I I see that. Um, will they be always mirrors? Will they just no, be pieces? No, not necessarily. Because we have a series in here too. Um, this is this is this is a beautiful series here. So you're responsible for the young man in the middle. My daughter's responsible. This guy and this guy. Yeah. In the background. It. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She did do the background. <laughs> Well, this is, for me, this is Sunday school, you know. Yeah. 
No, notice the dad's not there. Yes, my, this my, is the dad. Oh, that's the dad? Okay. In my story, my dad, dad didn't go to mom. Sunday school with us. He, he didn't go. These are the Mobleys. The Mobleys. The family visited me while they were here in Sonoma, visiting Sonoma. And they came to my studio and commissioned me to do this, my wow. daughter and I, to do this piece. Yeah. Wow. It was uh, 36 by 48. It was a it's nice a big, size. big piece, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it all mosaic? I'm sorry? Is it all mosaic? No, no, this isn't mosaic at all. This is on a wood nice board. Media. Right. It's on a wood board mixed media. Yeah. And oh, mixed media. Mixed media. So the clothing that you see is actual fabric. That's what Right, that's actual fabric, okay? Um, there was an artist that um, has been gone since 2010, Marie Johnson uh, Calloway. Um, she created um, an organization over there at Richmond Art Center called the Art of Living Black, which today is now um, art of the African diaspora. It's molded itself into that after all this time. And... Um, this work is, to me, um, an homage, uh, similar, way different. Hers were life-size people wearing their clothing. One of my favorites is the old couple sitting on the front porch. Mm. And um, his, his suspenders and his, the, the yellow collar, the yellowing collar on his white shirt was amazing. And that's what this work is like with a fresher, different kind of idea for me. Um, that's what it reminds me of, is, is her work from the past. What I like about mixed media is it can easily become a memory piece with old fabrics and things that were special. You can, there we go. Same thing with mosaics, with uh, ceramics that uh, you know, have special meaning. You can put them in a permanent piece of art right. easily. Just a, just want your favorite, you know, Jimi Hendrix T-shirt, save that rose on it or something, <laughs> right? Um, this is what I was talking about with the mosaics that are not mirrors, where oh. you've got these pieces yeah. here. That was there again. I was playing around to see if I can make it into something not functional, just art. Right. And I'm not crazy about it, but I tried it. <laughs> That's just the funny thing about artists. They're never <laughs> happy with what they're doing, right? These are amazing, especially the one with the couple in the center. Wow. I, I, that's one, I love that one. I love that you've got the checkboard flooring space going on in this, in this piece. I do the black and white checks a lot yep. because it, I'm a kitchen person, uh -huh. so kitchen things are attractive to me. So that black and white yeah, floor? Yeah, that black and white. Uh, does that for me. Red and white polka dots do that for me. Right. A lot of things do that. <laughs> I also wanted to find out about this mirror in particular. This is the one that is right in the back. Yeah. When I made that mirror, I was thinking about my mom. My mom was a domestic worker. She cleaned houses for a living. And um, every now and then when as I got older, she would take me to work with her. And then I saw all these ladies at the bus stop that also did domestic work and were catching the bus out to the suburbs. And uh, one of the things I realized was how popular my mom was. They all loved my mom. They sat on the back of the bus and they all talked. But um, this reminds me of uh, those ladies. And I remember hearing them talk about what different uh, uh, work ladies were offering for jobs and whatnot. So I remember those things. I remember hearing them say things like the bus fare was included or things like that. So I tried to add it in yeah. when I did this piece. And then their names. They all had Southern names. Well, I, yeah. yeah. They like, were nice. Yeah, my grandmother's was... We had Dolly May and Lovey. See, you don't hear those names anymore. And, 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 I remember Lovey. Yeah, Lovey. Like Lovey. A woman that never smiled. <laughs> <laughs> Not on a dime. That woman. My grandmother. Uh, and the other 
Dolly May, uh, she made dinners. And sold them. And sold them. I remember later at Shade Tree, doing Yeah, Shade Tree Mechanics and Beauty Parlors. Uh -huh. So a Shade Tree Mechanic is a guy kind of working on your car in his garage, okay? And so, uh, you know, $10 to get your car fixed, okay, instead of, you know, $250. Um, and so uh, they would, uh, they would at, the bar, at the beauty parlor, I went with my grandmother, and they would uh, argue about who was going to get the rolls that day. Because her rolls were, you know, like, we, we ate a half a tray of them, driving them from, my father, from her house to my father's house, and had to stop the car and put them in the trunk. So we would not eat all of them, okay? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, they, they were both uh, women who worked for uh, wealthy families. Mm -hmm. And um, in San Antonio, uh, two sisters, uh, one had shoes and the other one had oil, and then the other one had cattle and then oil. So that's who my grandmothers work for uh, in San Antonio. And... Um, yeah, my mom worked for, had several work ladies. Yeah, it, it was an interesting time. So I have just a couple more questions for you about your collection. How many dolls you got? Hundreds, oh, 300, yeah. 400? I'd never, see, I'd never seen that many in a collection ever. I don't even know. I have dolls still in boxes packed up. Wow. I don't have room for it. Wow. And these were, these were cherished dolls by every color child, black or every white. Every color. Every color child cherished these dolls. But you know one thing I noticed? Um, you know, not all things were made by people that were mean-spirited. No. You can tell by looking at a thing if it was made by somebody mean-spirited or not. I feel, I love all my dolls. I don't feel they were made by mean-spirited people. I just don't. Well, these were, there were three on my aunt's beds when I was really young. Um, we're talking late 50s, and um, they were teenagers. But those dolls were, you know, you had the pillows and the blah, and then three dolls. And uh, that's, that's where I, I remember these from. Uh, these are deep childhood memories uh, for me. My dolls me. are old. Well, this was, this is the 50s is a long time ago already, okay? You're old. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, okay? So these images here are loved by you and um, loved by many people. When we were talking, um, I told you the story of my son playing with his friend, going to his friend's house. It was still, you know, a family in Petaluma. And the family was white, and I got there, and the mom had this beautiful set of um, uh, cookie jars on the top of her refrigerator. They look like these ladies here. Mm -hmm. well, and, I, and I walked in, and I went, oh, my God, these are amazing, because they were in my grandma's house, too. And she said, yeah. And I said, well, God, you got a lot of them. You've been collecting them a long time? Because I was impressed. And she goes, yeah. So... About two weeks later, I go back, and they're not there. And I said, what happened to your, your cookie jar? She goes, well, I just put them away. I said, why? These are the coolest things I've seen for a long time. Now, I didn't go back a third time, but I wanted to encourage her to enjoy the art that she loved, obviously loved. And I don't know why she felt she needed to no longer have those out because yeah. I showed up, OK? If you love something, love it. I mean, all art forms are valid. And you don't have to justify a love for something that doesn't look like you. That's the way I look at it, OK? But a lot of people feel that there is a political thing about any of this stuff. They feel it's not politically correct. But that's people who feel like other people have the right to choose what they love. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't let anybody choose anything for me if I love something. I, you know, even if it seems, if I had something that seemed incorrect to somebody else, we have a, we have a Renoir painting in my living room, okay? Because his mom loved it. And we talked about it a long time, and she left it to us. There you go. 
Okay. I think Nothing Renoir. Nothing wrong with having a Renoir. In well, living room. Okay. It, it, it's n not <laughs> a real one. If you have a problem with it, bring it over. Give it over here. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> but I, I think that you have to, if we're gonna get down the road as a as a group of people, we have to open ourselves up to love what we love, and also honor and respect. The past and well, and live up to it and 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 uh, say it happened and now we're here let's go forward together well yeah to have a conversation about it you know I think, I think we, we more too often shy away from conversations around this and I think talking about it begins healing and we should we miss an opportunity when we put these things away. Right. You know, we should, we should have them out so that we can have these talks. Well, that's why I said, yeah. Janine, I think they're great. Why, why'd you put them away? I thought that yeah. was, to me, I don't let the world in enough to make my decisions about anything. <laughs> And because if we are limited by what we suppose is someone else's opinion, who is that? Where are they? I can't hear anything. It's just my, my holding myself back from the possibility of joy, enjoyment, uh, enlightenment. And so you have to let go of, oh, what will someone say about how I look today, or how I am. Who are they? Where are they? If you could find them for me and bring them to my house, I will allow them to talk to me about it. <laughs> but I think we hold ourselves back as a society from the pleasure of the unknown, the yeah. pleasure of opportunity. Well, the value of discourse. And the value of discourse, there you go. So, I, I know I could torture you with a number of 14 other questions, but I, I wanted to point out to you today that I chose you for this conversation because of your, um, your beautiful, mostly the mosaics, and also because I was looking for you for about four years. I didn't know where you were. I didn't know your name. Yes, I can hide. <laughs> She's real good at hiding. But it took hide. me a long time to find, and I'm trying to figure out how we found each other. Oh, it was an article. It just popped up. I was like, she lives in Sonoma County now? So that's how I found you again. Um, and really, we've only been meeting for the last couple months, but you know, when you find your people, you hold on to them, right? <laughs> Um, I want to say that it was the artwork that I saw years ago at that um, show called Black Artists on Art, and it was uh, the Calvin and Hobbes uh, tiger throughout that mosaic that I you did one with I was there. You were in that show. I could show you pictures. I could pull them up on my phone. Okay? I can't remember being there. 2015. Okay. Anyway, um, uh, I just want to say um, I appreciate your artwork. I appreciate your love of the past, revisiting it, recreating it, making it visible, making it beautiful. And um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I like to do an art talk that lasts for about as long as the conversation is necessary. And it feels really complete right now because we could either sit here for three days or we could sit here for as long as we did. But I want to again thank you all for coming out on a Sunday afternoon. Thank you very much. <laughs>